All right, let's get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our global webinar, Navigating the Converging Worlds of Cybersecurity and Information Governance. This webinar is a partnership between Everton Team and the EFCSE, which is the European Federation of Cybersecurity Experts. My name is Katie Tall. I'll be your host today. And before we get started, I'm just going to take care of a um, few housekeeping items. First of all, this webinar will be recorded. So we'll offer you an on-demand recording after the conclusion of the webinar. We'll also have the slides from today's presentation, which we'll be sending later today in an email to everyone who attended. If you have questions throughout the webinar, please feel free to submit them in the navigation page of the webinar tool. It's a little chat section. I'd also like to invite you to follow us on LinkedIn where you'll get updates on upcoming webinars and other news. And you'll be able to find more informative content on our blog and by signing up for a newsletter. I encourage you to do so. Visit our, web our website, excuse me, at everteam.com. And then lastly, there will be a short survey at the end where you can rate our webinar and include any feedback or additional questions, and we can follow up with you afterward. Uh, we'd greatly appreciate it if you could answer these questions um, so that we can continue to pro provide the most informative and helpful webinar content for you in the future. So with all of that being concluded, I'd like to get the webinar started and pass the baton on to our presenters, Ken Lowney from Everteam and Corinne Franz from Ubiquitous Solutions and General Secretary of the EFCSE. Thanks a lot, Katie. Good morning, everybody. It was fun, Katie, to hear you say good morning, good afternoon, and good night. I think that was a catchphrase from some TV-based presenter. Um, but it's true, we're connected to the US and North America from West Coast to East Coast, but also to Europe, and we time this so that it would be available to both, which is appropriate because we have two representatives here, two perspectives, myself and Corinne's. My name is Ken Lowney. I'm the Chief Customer Officer of Everteam. My job at Everteam is to focus on customers' use of our software to ensure success that of every customer, ensure that they optimize the use of our tool and get a great return on their investment. To do that, I have to play the role of a subject matter expert in information governance because that's where our software is focused. And for today, that's my role, to sort of represent a US perspective and an information governance perspective. You'll hear from a minute in, from Corinne. Corinne's the CEO of Ubiquitous Solutions, a consultancy uh, helping with digital transformation. But she also has a very important role that's uh, sort of the reason we have her here today. Corinne is the general secretary of EFCSE. And that means that she is a thought leader about cybersecurity, information security, and the application of solutions and capabilities for cybersecurity um, in a very broad way, not from a simplistic way, but more from a meaning of the evolution of our use of technology way. I love her tagline because she's not just working to advance the interest of vendors or to act as a governing body, Notice that it says she works for the enlightened development of digital use with the goal of ensuring it's both effective and respectful of people and their creativity force. So um, a very aspirational view of what uh, her organization is doing and enabling the ever increasing use of technologies while ensuring that we're always respectful of privacy and the impact on human lives. Today's session is going to be broken up into six very short chunks, if you will. 
I want to start with two starting perspectives. Then we're going to talk about, uh, in parallel, information security and cybersecurity and information governance and look at the two and sort of look at what they have in common and look at what they have different and try to come to a conclusion of what does that mean to you, the practitioners in the field, in your companies, and what the priorities are. So I'm going to start with that, two starting perspectives. And um, for the people in North America, perhaps they're more familiar. I'm picturing almost like, uh, and Corinne, uh, I hope it, it's not offensive, a cage match. We're in two corners, uh, and I'm representing one perspective, and Corinne is starting in another corner with a, a different position at the start. Now, there's a famous quote about the English language, and of course, the United States and Great Britain both speak English. But George Bernard Shaw once observed, the United States and Great Britain, they are two countries separated by a common language. And what he's trying to capture is that they have so much in common, but their language keeps them separated sometimes simply because we have different colloquialisms and vernacular. So I borrowed this. I'm no George Bernard Shaw, but I borrowed it and changed it. And I said, cybersecurity and information governance two disciplines divided by a common set of issues. And my point is that we have a lot in common between these two. And my goal today is to, with a peer, with a, a subject matter expert, to identify our paths going back and our paths going forward and where the overlap and uh, points of common interest are. So my perspective, and as I say at the top, we're sort of starting oceans apart. I'm American, uh, I'm male, I should point that out. I speak English as my first language. My focus is on information governance, evolving from records management and information governance and um, enterprise content management. And I have very much a vendor perspective. I work at Everteam, we're a software vendor. I think like a software vendor. I have customers, I'm very focused on that. Corinne is an ocean apart, she's European. I know she speaks English because we speak it together, uh, because I'm uh, I'm deficient in that I don't speak French, uh, and she does. She has, as the general secretary, a cybersecurity focus, and that's very different than a vendor perspective. So we have all these differences, and that's why we were really interested in connecting with Corinne and comparing perspectives. With that, Corinne, I was hoping you would talk for a minute about your role as general secretary and about the EFCSE. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Kim. Uh, I'm very happy to share this moment with you and especially with this uh, special uh, subject that cybersecurity is. Uh, the, I, I am general secretary of uh, European Federation of Cybersecurity Experts. That means uh, I manage a network of experts uh, in cybersecurity, but also in uh, digital trust and, cyber and uh, personal data processing. Uh, of course, cybersecurity, had, had, uh, uh, it's also a question of uh, defense and sometimes it's uh, military, but for us, it's uh, the goal is to uh, uh, help companies, of course, and all organizations in Europe to manage their um, digital transformation and specific place for cyber security and protect the, the data. Um, the, the Federation uh, was born at 2016, 16, sorry, <laughs> 2016. And uh, Ever Team is one of the founder members. Uh, and I think that the federation is now with very different profile. And it's very interesting because we are a think tank, we are do tank, and uh, we are special network hub and able to uh, manage the, the links between uh, the reality of the, the work and uh, institutional position of uh, Europe. 
it was it, it is not easy every day because Europe, as you say, as you know, is a different culture and different approach. And France is not the same than Italian, that is not the same than German, but we have now um, a goal uh, to, uh, to manage the, the, the security of the data. And you know that we have uh, special rules, but uh, we talk about that uh, uh, later in this presentation. Thank, Thank you. you for, Thank you very much. Um, so as I said, this first section was to set up Corinne and myself as two practitioners coming from entirely different perspectives. Again, mine from sort of a commercial vendor in the US and Corinne's from uh, a European perspective and as part of a public organization, a federation focused on doing good works and advancing uh, the, the interest and cause of cybersecurity and digitization in general. So we couldn't start off more different, I don't think. Let's see what happens. Um, I'm going to go first on this second section, which I call the evolutionary paths of these technologies. And uh, this is a way, I think, of information governance. So this is talking about the evolutionary path of information governance. And it's pretty straightforward. For those of you in this field, hopefully this will be very familiar. But it started, of course, with the first generation on the left of centralized paper records. We all know this model, and the key is the paradigm. The paradigm, if you will, is information workers identify items and say, these are formal records. These other things on my desk are not, but this item, this special item is a record. And those records are set aside. They're tagged by category or file plan, and they're collected and centralized and then retrieved when necessary. So that's the paradigm going back uh, certainly hundreds of years. So paper records identified, separated, and tagged by users, and then collected and centralized. The second generation, the electronic records space, which is right up until fairly recently, is very interesting to me because in a way nothing changed. The idea of centralized or electronic records is identical we ask users to identify certain items, certain documents or emails, declare them records. And when they're declared a record to add metadata, that is to tag them so that they can be categorized and classified and managed appropriately. And typically in a central location, most central, most electronic record solutions going back the last 20 years were about collecting and centralizing records, whether it was in Documentum or Open Text or FileNet or some other system, and managing them as a central store. Now we're in a third generation, and the question is why and what? And uh, that's what I'll address in this next slide. The reason there's a third generation is uh, straightforward. It has to do with exponential increase in volume and types. So there's much larger volumes of content. You've all seen slides that say in this next year, we'll create, in the next two years actually, we'll create more content than has been created in the history of the earth, uh, more information, if you will. So we have tremendously larger amounts of, of content, uh, including inside our organizations. We have more types of content not just formal records. We have emails, we have Slack messages, we have Twitter messages, we have lots and lots of media. So we have more types of content and many more locations for it. We can't centralize our records anymore because our records are everywhere. As soon as we think we have a handle on where things will be stored, a new SaaS-based service like Box or Dropbox comes along. So there's more locations where content is located and the regulatory burden for managing information, for managing records in particular, increases. So our four boxes say why the second generation isn't going to work. We can't ask users to organize and classify information and we can't store it all centrally. So the shift has been from management of a single content type or record in a single place to management of many content types in many places. That calls for a new approach. I call that the third generation of records management, 
but actually I call it information governance. So when people say, why is there a new word information governance instead of records management? It's because it's so different. Here are my three hallmarks of information governance, the third generation of records management. It's federated, meaning the content has to be managed in place. We can't assume we can centralize all the content. We have to assume we're gonna manage it wherever it is, and that's a federated model. It's integrated, meaning the solution won't be a big platform, an ECM solution. It's going to be a set of technologies that integrate with each other to do everything from connect and classify information to manage legal hold to deal with content disposition and destruction. And it has to use uh, artificial intelligence. We won't solve this third generation need without using automation to classify information, to organize information, and to dispose of information. So those are the three hallmarks, and that's how IG has evolved. Now, meanwhile, information security has evolved, and here I'll betray my simplisticness in terms of information security and cybersecurity. For me, cybersecurity has been a topic I studiously avoid. Isn't that funny for me to say, but it's true. Uh, I remember 20 years ago, I studiously avoided printer drivers because printer drivers never work. So I just gave up and I said, I don't do printers anymore, not my job. And I've kind of uh, had my fingers in my ears when it comes to information security and cybersecurity as well. They're complex topics to me. They haven't been my primary interest. And when I thought of cybersecurity, information security, I had a very simplistic view, which is it's about access, isn't it? So this chart on the left is really focusing on a simple part of cybersecurity, which is access. And once upon a time, it was really easy. We had all our computer systems in special raised floor rooms with special fire suppression with very limited access. The uh, terminals were hardwired. So all you had to do was prevent physical access to a single environment. But of course, things got remarkably more complex with networking with PCs, with networked PCs connected to backends. Then of course, the internet, which took it out of the enterprise and the uh, expansion, I should say, the explosion of mobile devices. So all these things have made access a simple proposition of keep people away from the mainframe to an almost impossible task um, that is characterized by uh, people trying to access uh, millions of times a day any major corporation through various layers. It's also changed the approach from a simple deny access to a user to what they call defense in depth, that we, need, we can't rely on a firewall and say, there, we're good, we've got the wall up. We have to assume that will be penetrated uh, at the perimeter, and then we need to uh, continue to defend our content, our information through a variety of means from policies to technologies to threat detection and to reaction after it happens. What do we do in a ransomware attack? Speaking of ransomware, this chart is simplistic. This is about access, but information security and cybersecurity, as Corinne's about to talk about, is now about much more than just access. It's about a change to a, a focus from access to uh, what's called the CIA triad confidentiality, integrity, and availability of data, uh, CIA, confidentiality, and integrity, and availability. So there's been changes in the digital security, the information security space as well. Also an explosion of, con uh, of volume, absolutely. Also an explosion of threat types from access to viruses, to phishing, to ransomware, to data breaches in tremendous scale. So an explosion of threat types and also changes with a focus on data quality and in particular now on privacy. So an information security person has gone from a guard at a firewall to an incredibly uh, comprehensive and complex set of activities to deal with all these aspects, not just access to confidentiality, ensuring integrity, integrity, ensuring availability in the case of a system downage. I'm gonna let Corinne pick it up for a second from there and talk about 
her view of information security today. Corinne? Yes. Um, it's interesting to uh, to see in first the, the, the result of European Commission uh, shows that uh, European citizens or companies are insufficiently aware of cybersecurity in its use, with 51% of Europeans feel informed about this, and 69% of companies do not realize their risk at all or very little in regard to this type of threats. And when you see the, the, three, the three pillars of uh, information security, uh, cybersecurity and compliance, uh, this is a most important problem in in Europe, but not only, of course, because I, I say Europe because it's uh, a bit bad. <laughs> we are talking about information security all around the world and all around the companies and all organizations and all people and cities and around the world. Uh, it's a globalization and, and digitalization. That's the reason why we have uh, very strong effects there is emergence of ethical question concerning the respect of private life, of course, regulatory compliance related to information processing and their manipulation, and importance of proper information governance, of course. That is the principal subject. Be able to manage all this information, not only in company, but in all the aspects of the life of people and company, because people have a life outside companies and outside works. That's also the, the reason of the, the, the big problematics. And of course, we have necessity to have a capable and competent information system to face these operations. Um, due to all this, uh, it's not uh, exhaustive, of course, we have um, other subjects to, uh, to, to focus on, but for the moment, uh, especially here and around this table, we have this big question around information governance and what is it and how to do with it. This makes great sense to me and it starts to show where our paths intersect, Corinne. Um, from very narrow interests, as I said, my narrow interest 20 years ago in records management and information securities concerns 20 years ago about access to a, a really tremendously complex and comprehensive set of issues, some of which we have in common. Hmm. So I'm gonna move on to part three. And part three starts to deal with the non-technology for a moment. I call it questions of ownership. And I'm putting myself, hopefully, in the position of you folks out in the audience and asking the question, who owns these problems? Who owns IG and CyberSec? Um, today, in information governance, beyond records managers, we're seeing new titles. We're seeing, of course, chief data officers, chief compliance officers. With the privacy regulations, we're seeing designated people responsible for privacy. So we're seeing new titles, and they're not all in IT. So in this slide, you see there's three choices. Who should own information governance, for instance? Is it an IT role, a business role? Uh, and when I say the business, I, I mean the people concerned with the P&L and making money and serving customers. Or is it legal and compliance specialist, the legal chief legal officer? chief compliance officer, et cetera. So who in IG, and in this case, I'll say, and cyber and information security owns these initiatives? Who's responsible? And kind of a predictable answer, it is uh, syndication, if you will. These issues require stakeholder involvement from all those parts and not just from the business and IT and legal and compliance, also from third parties because our businesses are complex and we have uh, many outside vendors who work with us, many supply chain participants who are integral to the service we deliver and the way we deliver it and the security of the information and the management of the information. 
In this area, I wanted to give an example from real life and then ask Corinne to do the same. My example is from a global financial services company. So let me tell you this story and uh, hopefully for some of you, it will make a lot of sense. This is a story of a person who was brought into an organization with a records management title, but who happened to also be an attorney and was brought in at a, I'll call it a director level to a financial service organization. This is a very large worldwide financial services organization. And he was brought in with a mandate to say, deal with the new regulations, deal with compliance, fix it and get us up to date. So that was a legal and compliance specialist coming in. But it was incredibly important for him to immediately build relationships with IT and business units. If he tried to do his, if he tried to take on his mission without doing it, he'd still be in the starting gate. He needed IT because that's where a lot of the information assets are. And that's where a lot of the systems that he wanted to implement would have to live. And to be honest, that was a challenge. At first, IT was sort of saying, who are you and, and why are you here? We'll take care of this. So there was a fostering of a relationship, lots of interesting discussions and challenges. And it took some C-level, uh, COO uh, force to get everyone on the same page. Meanwhile, uh, my protagonist in this story also had to build a relationship with the business. He had to start to ask the business to take on certain initiatives even though they weren't central to the business and he had to win that trust and say this is critical to the business because if we have a data breach for example your brand is in huge trouble a la wells fargo so it was really interesting to watch this person i can't use his real name i'll call him fred because i'm not sure there's anyone left in the world named fred except maybe two people on this phone call who i just offended Sorry, Katie. Uh, we'll call him Fred. And Fred's job was build these relationships, build these uh, alliances, create a stakeholder group and a steering committee that could speak to all the disparate aspects of information governance, not from a weak position of please do these things, but from a mandated position from a sea level that said these things will get done and I'm holding you accountable. It was remarkable to watch and it took basically a year to get organized around the initiative because we've all seen records management initiatives that don't take, they don't have full support, and ultimately they don't deliver the results. So I think for information governance today, because it's complexified, if I can use that word, it does require a real strong alliance from all parts of the business and service providers. Now I wanted to ask Corinne to speak to example, an example. Her example, uh, her situation that she wanted to talk about was from a, a healthcare initiative. Corinne? Yes, Kim. Um, it's it's about uh, a special uh, subject around uh, hospital and all the the place where people are can can have. A big problem if uh, there is a uh, information uh, the security uh, in bad position it could be critical uh, in health sector it's always the case uh, for example in uh, europe there is a health system cyber security support unit special specially dedicated to provide uh, an health support to uh, management uh, and information system security incident. The main goal are, um, of course, alert and inform all actors in the event of the threat, uh, share the best practice in prevention and response to incidents. And um, it's uh, also to be able to have help to be sure that uh, the quality of, uh, of the, the health, uh, and the care will be okay. You, you can see here some uh, key figure and you as you see it's a very very high value the risk of breaking service or sharp shutdown are still critical in sectors such as health and when you see that uh, there is um, uh, 50 percent uh, 
which have uh, an impact of the patient personal information is very very uh, critical position and um, in that case the cooperation and the coordination are not enough but fundamental and you can imagine the same level in uh, energy or defense sector for example and we have this problem in France, and uh, not far from today, three or four days before, uh, there, is an, there was an, an attack against uh, an hospital. Um, it was not very critical, but very important. And fortunately, uh, the people who work in uh, this hospital use uh, the, the services from Europe and from this uh, special uh, support unit and uh, that's the reason why for one hour they had problems but they found solutions due to this uh, special support unit and um, it's positive <laughs> it's just the beginning but i think that we can uh, underline this uh, uh, this information and this news this makes great sense to me, and it really does highlight the same situation in your world and mine, which is there's not a single point of ownership or a single point of vulnerability, that that patient information exists in many places, um, at the patient's bedside, at, in the centralized systems of the organization, but then also in traditional IT systems like billing information, and then third parties like insurance providers. So it just, again, highlights the complexity of the world we've built. We've made the world uh, more and more flexible and fluid for how information flows. But of course, that makes it more challenging to protect that information and ensure its integrity and ensure the privacy of the owners. So very much a similar situation there between our two organizations. Um, and in a way, that sounds like we're just commiserating. Boy, our jobs are hard. And they are hard, but we do have common things in, we have things in common also as well in terms of solutions. And that would bring me to part four, which is the impacts of emerging technologies. So sort of we've been commiserating. Now, what about new technologies? Where do they fit? Are they be, uh, adding to the challenge or are they adding to the solution? And I'll take the information governance perspective first and say the answer is yes. They are adding to the challenge and they're adding for sure to the solution. Uh, I'm very optimistic about the use of natural language processing, AI and blockchain for information governance. This is a very simple view, but it will take me a moment to explain. Uh, from left to right across the top, I view this as a life cycle of information governance about connecting to information then analyzing and then searching it, enhancing and classifying it, managing it through its life cycle from creation to destruction, and then keeping a record of all activities. And you can see that I've mapped technologies, what I'll call emerging newer technologies, against these activities. And in solutions like Everteams, this is where we're investing and adding the capabilities from these technologies to our solution. Natural language processing is natural for analyzing and search. NLP has to do with things like look for items, not by a search from the user, that the user knows what he's looking for, but the user doesn't know exactly what they're looking for. So have a fuzzier way of finding what they need and giving them the results, even though they didn't ask explicitly for it. So that has to do with a lot of technologies. I've mentioned entity extraction here. Entity extraction is a great example of a new, newer approach, an NLP approach that solves a key problem. What NLP does is go inside every content item and look for anything that, in quotes, looks like a country name and add that country name to the metadata. Search for anything that looks like a person name or an address any type of entity and promote it and put it in the metadata of the item. And once it's in the metadata, now we can use it as part of a rule set to classify the item. We can do lots of things with AI and classification. We can match text patterns. We can use machine learning. And we do use these things because classification is at the center 
of information governance. We want to know for every content item, what kind of content is it? How do we classify it? And what are the rules for it in terms of where it can live, who can have access, and when it can be destroyed? At the end of the life cycle, there's use of blockchain. We're starting to see this for keeping a track of the Provence of every item. Where did it start? Think of it as a chain of custody that tells us this content item has lived in the following places and the nature of blockchains makes that a completely immutable record. So we're seeing these new technologies. I wanna really point out the area of classification because it's something we have in common with information security. If you think about information security, one basic element is to classify items. Do we care about this? Is it private information? Is this company confidential information? Is this uh, double secret, extra special secret information? So we classify items for both disciplines and we have technologies today that can do that classification automatically and take the human out of it. In the future, we see a lot more going on with artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, and NLP, even RPA or robotic processing automation for managing repetitive tasks uh, so that we don't need a, a human reviewer and the addition of smart contracts on top of blockchain. So lots of technology uses here to help us solve the problem. As I often summarize it, Computer technology got us into this problem with all the different types of content in all the places. The good news is computer technology can help solve it with natural language processing, machine learning, deep learning, and blockchain. So lots of positive perspective on where we're going with new technologies for information governance. And I think Corinne has some overlap. I know she's going to talk for a moment about blockchain, but also look at some of the challenges such as the social media world that creates new info government, excuse me, information security challenges. Corinne? Yes, um, I just want to underline the, the, the importance of cooperation between public and private sector on uh, research and innovation on all the subjects that you talk about. Uh, and this is a special goal for, for country, for state member of Europe and for Europe too, and all the country around the world. Um, remember um, when 50 million Facebook profiles harvested for Cambridge Analytics in major data breach. It was a new trigger for the European Union. Uh, of course, we knew that uh, information are everywhere and too much information are able to uh, to go through a different media, but it was a uh, I don't know the word in English, but in French it's a gifle, it's a clack in the, in the face <laughs> and uh, to wake up people and to help people to understand and company too, and government, especially government. Um, I want to give you an example of a special project, very interesting in Europe. It's uh, in the health sector. His name is My Health, My Data. It's a European project uh, that allows hospital to record medical data access requests. And for hospital that are worried about data confidentially, no trusted third party, and uh, it's not uh, feasible, and only the accredited entities can access the system, which is implies the use of private authentication authenticated blockchain and uh, it's the first big uh, project with uh, uh, blockchain technology in the uh, health sector big 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 subject because it's not only one country of course it's uh, between um, uh, many many states in Europe and um, it's possible also, and we work not only in the Federation, but uh, we have a special working group in Federation with uh, the subject like blockchain and, and new technology. And you, we have currently worked to uh, help uh, insurance sector 
to fight against fraud and to secure the transaction. Uh, we have in France and in Germany and in uh, Spain uh, this um, project and I think that we, we can give you in few, probably at the beginning of next year some information to, uh, to help you to and some results to help you to, to see the, the kind of solution that uh, we can use in that sector. It's very interesting. I'm very, very interested in the blockchain side of things for all those reasons on both of our worlds. So as you folks listening in can hear, we arrive at many commonalities, the changing nature of our, our work or these two disciplines, the impact of new technologies, the impact of the enormous explosion of data, but also some of the potential for new technologies to help solve these problems. I want to finish with what I call part five, the regulatory environment, and then go through some wrap up. For me, it's really simple on the information governance side. There's been an unbelievable change in the last couple of years that I, I capture in this picture. It's gone from a view at the top above the blue line where what records management was concerned was you must preserve records. The central question was, how long do I need to keep this? What's the retention rule? And IRS says I need to keep it seven years. But I've got the New York State logo here because there's a regulatory set called NYDFS. NYDFS for financial services organizations in New York have other retention rules. So those rules say, how long do I need to keep things and why do I need to keep them? To prove they happen, to preserve evidence. So a lot of our focus for a long time has been, uh, I'm gonna give this to Iron Mountain, I'm gonna keep it for four years or seven years or 10 years or 20 years based on a set of policies. That's where our quote heads have been. Now we've got a exact mirror image. No, 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 it's not just you must preserve sec certain records, you must destroy other kinds of records or sometimes the same records. You must destroy personal information to protect the privacy of your customers unless it meets certain criteria or carve outs. So unless you meet certain criteria, you cannot retain your customer's information. You have to have permission. It has to be necessary for the business, et cetera, et cetera. If you've looked at the GDPR regula regulation or the California version, CCPA, then you know that this is what it's about. It's about protecting privacy and saying you must destroy data and that individuals have the right to be forgotten. So these are really interesting mirror images, a set of regulations that have always said how long we need to keep things and a new set of regulations that says you cannot keep most things that have to do with individuals. A huge shift in regulatory focus and again, another reason why records management is no longer the right term because it's not just keeping records, it's managing all types of information, including managing it for privacy, and that we need much more than the ability to collect records and centrally store them. We need to know at any time everything about all the information in all our systems. There's a parallel shift in the uh, information security and cybersecurity world because privacy, GDPR as an example, is actually central to both of us. Uh, and I'll let Corinne talk about that for a minute as cybersecurity has matured and uh, become a more comprehensive view than it was at one point, including GDPR. Go ahead, Corinne. Yes, uh, GDPR, you are right. GDPR is just uh, a piece of, uh, of the puzzle, but uh, it's important because it's, um, uh, it's something to, uh, to help uh, people and organization to um, to have a, a, a good uh, a framework for their information. Uh, the GDPR is uh, regarding any organization, private or public, is concerned if it's established on the territory of the European Union or if its activity directly targets European citizen. Um, it's important also for US because for economic change, of course, sometimes some uh, company are in Europe. Um, 
In the first, it implies information duty to the users concerned by the processing of their personal data with the guaranteed respect and protection of privacy and the rights of people. Its impact company and organization and uh, the GDPR was uh, came in force in, on May 2018 and um, one and a half years af uh, after it's it's not spectacular <laughs> it's not spectacular but it helped organization and it helped people to manage better their uh, their, their information it's um, it's an obligation that's the reason why it's sometimes it's not very good for for organization because it costs it costs money very it's very expensive uh, it forces companies to frame and structure their approach to managing the information they collect and already uh, if they have information uh, just to remind you uh, if company does not um, follow the, the rules it's very exp it could it should be very exp expensive it should could, uh, cost something that um, 10 millions or 20 millions if uh, you don't you, you don't respect the, the rules uh, for the moment even if i say it's not spectacular <laughs> uh, i think that it can show the new way for uh, organization to manage their own information. Uh, I know and we know that uh, Europe uh, must change a lot of things, many things in, the, in this, uh, in this, in this uh, regulation. Uh, it's uh, in progress for the moment, but um, the, the, the problem is that the core of the GDPR is gradual handling. Uh, all incoming data in organization has to be traced, pseudonymized, minimized, and very few company and organization have put such measures in place. For the moment, uh, the proper data governance goes through this and it's not, we are not up to date in this. And I think that uh, when the can say that uh, we have many examples of problematic of governance of data and uh, in Europe and specifically in France, uh, we, we are working on it and uh, the future is not right in a good way for the moment, but I think that we have some very good uh, value now to help and uh, to accompany company uh, with this transformation. And there is, uh, yes, ju just to finish, we have um, not only GDPR, but we have also uh, cooperation between Europe and US especially with, with a privacy, privacy shield and with uh, cyber security standards. And I think that this is a good way to, uh, to help and to manage the, the future for the, the good um, regulatory and a good uh, governance on, of information. This makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and again, it's GDPR, I think you used the term is or maybe you didn't use this phrase, but just the tip of the iceberg uh, mm -hmm. in dealing with it. I know that there's also new acts and new things happening. Uh, I don't know about the Cybersecurity Act. Is that a newer regulation or has that been in place for a long time? Correct? No, it's, it's, uh, it's not for a long time. It's uh, for, um, from 2016. And it's the same, it's the same um, context. Uh, this is the EU, uh, in, uh, European Union invests uh, many million of euro inside partnership and uh, and uh, to uh, build a good organization to help uh, Europe to be uh, to have 
sovereignty of, uh, of its uh, digital uh, sector. And the um, uh, Cybersecurity Act uh, gives uh, power to an agency. This is, this is uh, Cybersecurity Agency ENISA. And the second point is to be able to manage certification uh, to help uh, the, 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 the country and all the member states of Europe to be sure that they have the, the same and, um, and the common uh, organization to, uh, to build their um, digital transformation. But I... it's, it's currently, it currently works. But uh, it's uh, it's just the beginning because it's just three three years and you know as I said at the beginning of the of the webinar in Europe we have a very different culture very different uh, approach and that's the reason why it's maybe harder that uh, you can have you in US because USA is one country with uh, all American people. <laughs> in Europe. It's uh, one, not exactly one country, it's one uh, union with very different people around the table. So that's the reason why it takes time, but but it works now. And, it's, uh, and I think that for the next year, there is a new program, the name is uh, Horizon 2020, and uh, very, I, I think that uh, we will have a very huge opportunity to build um, a, a, a good challenge and a, a good uh, organization to uh, to manage not only cyber security of course but uh, all the, the protection of the, the data and uh, and to be able to uh, to develop uh, new services and new business of course because uh, it's not big, it's the most important we need to have business around new services uh, in um, digital area. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, this makes sense. We uh, our time grows short, so I'm going to move into a wrap up now. And um, before I do, I'll just say um, to Corinne, I understand exactly what you mean uh, as a European Union of disparate countries with different histories. But jokingly, I say I'm originally from New York, and my differences from someone in Southern California are also pretty deep. Perhaps not as much as France and Germany but close if I've ever been in uh, California. Let me go ahead and move into wrap up. And um, my goal here today was to have a discussion with Corinne in front of everyone, talk from our disparate perspectives, and then see what is actually overlapping at the intersection of our two domains and disciplines. Here are the takeaways I wanna share. The scope of both our disciplines has expanded dramatically over the last 20 years. They've gone from in information security worrying about a single point of access to worrying about uh, not just access, but the C, I, and A of information security across many, many layers and systems. And my concerns in records management have gone from managing records in a central place to managing content wherever it lives. It's also true that we can't rely on just IT or just a records management, that success in these areas require not just even involvement, but support and sponsorship from stakeholders across the enterprise and even with third party providers. It, we also found out that we're both focused on new technologies, uh, which present new challenges, but offer new capabilities. Uh, new tools to accomplish our goals. And lastly, that privacy is a common ground, a common area that um, we both are embracing as a, the next challenge uh, for information governance. As I said, it's a sea change from keeping stuff to getting rid of stuff based on regulatory requirements. I also should have had another box that talked about classification because classification is the, the heart of these two disciplines. In information governance, we want to classify all content, put it into a file plan and associate a set of policies and retention rules. And information security, we want to classify all information to know how it should be treated, what its level of sensitivity is. And I, I bring that back up because that has to do with the use of 
machine learning and deep learning to do some of that classification. So these are some of the things we've learned. And when I bring it to a conclusion, I, I want to come back to the title that Katie provided. Katie mentioned that the title is Navigating the Convergence of Our Disciplines. How do you navigate it as a pr practitioner? And I, I start with a very hopefully humble and honest, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how you navigate it, but I know how you start. And at the starting point, whether uh, Corinne was your client or whether you are an Everteam customer, excuse me, I misspoke, whether you are a client of Corinne's or an Everteam customer, our answer would be, we know where to start. And it's, you must know the current state. You know, must know the what and the where and the how of the information you have, what information, what types of information, where is it stored, how is it protected today, how is it classified today? And that will result in a heat map that says, well, we can't solve everything, but there's certain areas that are very high risk. There's information that you shouldn't have, private information, for instance, stored in places it shouldn't be, where it's more vulnerable. So that's the starting point. I call that an information inventory or a, a cyber audit. They're really getting at the same point, the current state. That clearly is the starting point. I wrote that slide without Corinne's uh, direct approval. Corinne, are you comfortable with that summary as a starting point for the first step for our audience? Yes, yeah, sure, sure. Simple and clean, sure. And uh, I'll use my one French word, parfait. Uh, Perfect, yes. <laughs> for those Just... of you who are English only on the phone, parfait is a wonderful word because it means perfect. And I know yes. how to say it because I like parfaits with ice cream, so it's perfect. Um, mm -hmm. And that's what we had to present today. As I say, thank you to Corinne for the preparation, for the energy, for the effort. I also want to say there's a very natural follow-on to this webinar. It is part of a series, and I'd love to talk to you again. On January 7th, uh, and I know that's a little ways away, but December is a tough time to get everyone together. On January 7th, I'll do a session called Conducting an Information Assets Inventory. This is that first step. And I'll take you through some examples, real life schedules and project plans, best practices, tasks, and especially tools, things like inventory worksheets and how to do that. And I'll share with you how you can use technology today, like artificial intelligence and natural language, to do some of the inventory work rather than just walk around and ask people to tell you. So this is the idea. Uh, I'd love to talk to you about that on January 7th. Um, I'm gonna change the mode on my computer for one second. Please bear with me. I know this is unusual, but I want you to have the URL as well. So it's HTTPS and slash slash info.everteam.com slash info assets hyphen assets. So if you yes, look on this, go ahead, Katie. Oh, I did type it into the chat as well. Oh, good for you. Thank you. Uh, I'll go back into uh, view mode, view present. And there it is. So there's that URL. Oops. And Katie mentioned she's already uh, put it into the chat. Go right there and uh, register if you want to register for the January 7th event. And as I said, my goal is to make it a natural follow-on from this, how to do an inventory asset, um, in, an inventory of your information assets, excuse me. Katie, that's everything I had. I know I'm really pushing the time. We're at 10.59, so I'm all set and I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, please don't forget to submit your comments um, in our survey. You can also email us at us underscore marketing at everteam.com. Please uh, do register for that next webinar. Start the year off right. It's 2020. I can't believe it. So thanks, everybody. This concludes our webinar and see you next time. Thank you, everybody. Bye, Katie. Thank you.